Hello, my name is Victor Lopez and this is Direct Democrats. My website is directdemocrats.com. At the end of the video, you will find uh, information to contact me because I'm happy to speak about direct democracy anywhere in the world, anytime, in any forum. I think there are many misconceptions about direct democracy all over the world. Also, you will uh, find that my videos are all closed caption in the major languages of the world, in some 33 languages. I'm pretty sure your language or a language you speak is probably in there. Today, I'm going to talk about something that really, really concerns me, almost as much as the war in the Ukraine, about which I made a few videos. What concerns me is the states of the US democracy. I know, this concerns many people. But yeah, but concerns me, and this is why I want to talk about it. Because if US democracy goes into a deeper and deeper crisis, as it seems to be going, then we're all screwed. Because if US democracy collapses, then the other democracies probably cannot survive for one reason. And it's because we have the Chinese dictatorship breathing down our necks. I think there are some possibilities that China will ditch the Communist Party because they probably realized that with such an approach to international politics, they're just getting the whole world against them. And hopefully, China, mainland China, will inspire itself into the Taiwanese model. The Taiwanese have now direct democracy with many elements of Swiss direct democracy, which, by the way, Swiss direct democracy has not much to do with California direct democracy for many details. The U.S. concerns me because for many years now, and I've been following the U.S. US politics for many years, when I was living in Spain and also living now in Canada. And it concerns me because it's almost like a broken record. I mean, the Republicans, they consider the Democrats pretty much the devil. You know, that they're destroying America. And the Democrats, they basically feel the same way about the Republicans. So we have this crazy polarization. Then we have all kinds of political shows on the left and the right, and basically, practically none, none of them is really independent. They're all biased with political orientation. Many of them are pro-Republican, right-wing, others are pro-Democrat, left-wing, but they make a lot of noise, but not much light comes out of the noise. You know, not much light comes out of all those verbal sparks. What's going on? I mean, the America, it seems to be always in the same mood. The polls of the citizens, time after time, say the country is not heading in the right direction. But nobody seems to be putting it in the right direction. Nobody. It doesn't matter if the Republicans are in power or the Democrats are in power. There are some minor changes depending on the orientation of the party in power, depending who controls Congress. But basically, U.S. politics are heavily polarized, are partisan as hell. You cannot really listen to any independent media. All news are filtered by the bias, prejudice of different political orientations, and on and on and on. There's not one single issue one single big issue where the left and the right in the U.S. agree. Sometimes they do, very seldom, because it is so obvious that the threat affects the whole country that there is no choice. For example, now, Republicans and Democrats have agreed that China presents a big problem. They have agreed to that. But that's about it. On border control, they disagree. I mean, they totally disagree. The Republicans think the Democrats are nuts, and the Democrats think that the Republicans are a bunch of racists. With the war in Ukraine, pretty much the same. The Democrats, they are for helping the Ukraine with weapons, with everything necessary to push the Russians back to outside the Ukraine. And the Republicans is basically the opposite, that, you know, they don't side with Putin, but they feel that, oh, maybe the involvement is too much, we shouldn't do that, this is, this is not our war, and this and that. And with many other issues, it's the same. I mean, healthcare, 
The Democrats are more or less for universal health care, but they are not able to bite the bullet, even if they have majority in the House and in the in the car in the Senate and in the, in, and they control the White House. They just don't seem to be able to. So, I mean, you tell me where which policy of national importance you have agreement and you don't have this terrible polarization in the United States. Basically none. It doesn't matter which day of the week you turn the TV or the radio. It doesn't really matter. You find polarization and polarization and polarization. And democracy cannot survive with that continuous polarization. The political parties, all of them, are discrediting themselves. Not only in the United States, in places like Canada, France, the UK, Germany, Australia, etc., the politicians are heavily discredited. In, for example, a country like Canada, which used to be considered a very stable, very well-run country, now the polls show that the majority of Canadians think the politicians do not care about them. And this is not conservative Canadians saying that the liberal government doesn't care about them, or uh, progressive or liberal Canadians saying that the conservative government doesn't care of them. No, the poll, represent, the poll represents everybody. Generally speaking, the politicians in all representative democracies, they have brought the countries to a deep mess. I think the basic reason is because representative democracy gives so much power to the elected politicians that the fight to gain power, to win power, to control the levers of the state is so vicious, so vitriolic, that they end up in polarization. And the polarization is increased because of this crazy, yes, I say crazy, this crazy, in my opinion, decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. By the way, a conservative Supreme Court this is also how bad things have gotten in the U.S. Even the court is conservative or liberal or progressive. Anyway, this conservative court, many years ago, maybe two or three decades ago, said that organizations also have civil rights. Therefore, it doesn't matter how powerful the organization, the business, the professional association, they have civil rights. And that means they can donate and organize events to help political candidates with no limit, with no economic limit. The situation now is the following. If you are not a politician in the United States that is not backed by powerful lobbies, and I don't care if you are on the right or the left, you will not go anywhere. And if you go somewhere, sooner or later they'll take you down. Because that's the way it works. To be heard, you need lots of money. And the money comes from one place, from the people, the organizations that have money. So you have this ridiculous situation in the United States, but in the other representative democracies, is very much the same, where the money of the people with money, of big organizations, big lobbies, rich people, that money is used by the politicians to finance to finance their campaigns. And they have to use the campaigns to persuade ordinary voters that if the politicians get elected, they will be working for ordinary voters. They will not be working for the money that finances their campaigns. I mean, this is naive or idiotic, or maybe both. But it is obvious that the U.S. politicians, and I say in most other representative democracies the same way, the U.S. politicians, they have to satisfy the lobbies. Sometimes the lobby is not a lobby as such, but it's a big bank that lend, lends the political party a lot of money to finance the campaign. So, I mean, it's the same thing. If you donate to the campaign or you make a loan so they can finance the campaign, it's the, th it's the same thing, isn't it? It means the people who give you the loan has some control over you. So we have this situation that is not really changing. You know, you can go many decades back and the political situation in the United States is getting worse and worse. And my big concern, although I'm not an American, is because if American democracy weakens, gets shaky, 
or dies, then we're all finished. Because there is no way Canadian democracy can survive as a democracy if the U.S. democracy goes to hell and we have on the other side the Chinese. Again, I think the Chinese sooner or later will realize that the system they have dehumanizes them. That only has provided them is with money. But they have another system, also a Chinese system in Taiwan, that gives them dignity and freedom and gives them even more money than the communist system, than the CCP system they have in China. So I'm sure, sure there is enough smart people in China that they will wake up and just like Deng Xiaoping said, you know what? This communist economic system doesn't work. We better adopt capitalism. They did that and the rest is history. China progressed amazingly, you know, removing a lot of people from misery and poverty. But Deng Xiaoping, being a good communist, I suppose, couldn't go all the way and didn't have the courage or the wisdom to say, we have to ditch the communist economic system and also the communist political system because sooner or later it's going to restrict us. And the proof of it is that Taiwan has taken off way ahead of China with fewer resources. Deng Xiaoping was not able to do it. I don't think the current guy will do it. She, the Xi guy, I think he believes in power from the top. I mean, he can agree that maybe capitalism is better, but this is a capitalism that has to be controlled by the state, very much like the Nazis did with the German capitalists. But sooner or later, somebody will come along and finish the job that Deng Xiaoping started and turn China into a, a democracy, at least a representative democracy, and hopefully a direct democracy like they're starting to have in Taiwan. Taiwan is amazing because they went from dictatorship to representative democracy, now to direct democracy. Switzerland is the most established direct democracy nation in the world, practically the only one for many years. But Taiwan has adopted many of the measures of the Suez. And this is where I come to the core of this story. I think the Americans should take a page from the Suez. The Suez, interestingly, set up their constitution after the American constitution. But in the 1800s, they changed it. They added to it. In the 1800s, they added something amazing, which proved to be revolutionary. And to be, to be honest with you, I don't think the Swiss anticipated how powerful and how good the change they made was going to be. The story started in Zurich. In the 1800s, in Zurich, they have a pandemic. And the people decided that the way the politicians handled the pandemic was not very good. Yes, yes, it rings bell, doesn't it? Anyway, the people got so mad at the politicians in the canton of Zurich that they demanded to have a say in all political decisions from then on. They wanted to have a say on policies and laws and also changing the constitution of the canton. The politicians, being at the time Zurich a representative democracy, didn't want to hear anything about this. It's obvious why. They will be losing a lot of power because if the people have a say over the policies and the laws the politicians pass, then that means that politicians have to pass laws and policies that the people do not disagree with strongly. Because if they do, in a direct democracy like they have now in Zurich, and from Zurich spread to all of Switzerland, any policy, any law, any article of the Constitution, the people have the last say. The people can stop any law. They can stop any policy. And on their own initiative, they can change the Swiss Constitution. And they do the three things regularly. The Swiss people can also tell the politicians to pass new laws or new policies to address subjects that the people feel the politicians are not addressing. You can imagine the magnitude of, of the change. Swiss politicians before, they were used like American politicians, Canadian politicians, French politicians, Japanese politicians, all politicians of all representative democracies. They were used to 
we get elected, and then we do what we think is best for the country, which means we do anything we want. Doesn't mean that it's necessarily capriciously, it may be well thought out, but they have the authority. Once the people vote and they put the politicians in power, the people in the United States and in the other representative democracies can do absolutely nothing about any new policy, any new law the politicians pass. The only thing they can do is complain. They may, can go, they may be able to go on the streets, overturn containers, set cars on fire, make lots of noise, and maybe, maybe the politicians will re respond to that, but maybe they, they don't. The American people, the Canadian people and the rest do not have a mechanism to tell the politicians, wait a minute, that law that you are passing, that you have passed, we don't like it. And we're going to have a referendum. We're going to have a number of signatures, about 1% of registered voters. And if 1% of registered voters agree that the issue should go to a referendum, it goes to a referendum. And there is nothing the politicians, the Supreme Court, or anybody else can do. It goes to a referendum. And the result of the referendum becomes binding. If the referendum says that policy we don't approve, the policy is out. If the referendum says that law we don't approve, we don't want it, the law is taken out of the books. If the referendum says we want to change these articles of the Constitution, the Constitution is changed. And there is nothing the politicians can do about it. Even if unanimously the parliament and the executive of Switzerland said, we don't like this decision by referendum of the people, they can do nothing. They have to eat it. They have to eat it and implement it. And even more so, even the Supreme Court of Switzerland, even the Supreme Court of Switzerland cannot overturn the results of a referendum on constitutional grounds. Even more, the Swiss Supreme Court is expressly forbidden from intervening on political decisions. The only way the Swiss Supreme Court could intervene in a political decision, such as a referendum, is if, if there have been irregularities in the process of executing the referendum, referendum, counting the ballots, and so forth. There is an amazing, an amazing effect of Swiss direct democracy. You see, when the Swiss politicians realize, you know, if we pass a law or a policy and doesn't have support by the majority of the citizens, they may kick it out. They may scrap it. So we better pass laws and policies that we know have the support of the majority of the people, or at least we honestly think they will do. They can still challenge us, but maybe it will not happen very often. So... The politicians on the left and the right in Switzerland, once they realized that, they said, you know what, we better get together and pass laws and policies by consensus that have the support of the majority of the citizens on the left or the right. On some issues, maybe the law will get more support from the left on others more from the right. But overall, between the support of the left and the right, it will be an overwhelming majority. And the four major political parties in Switzerland, conservative and progressives, you will not believe this, they govern in coalition, this for decades now. They govern in coalition. And the debates they have in the Swiss parliament, they are intelligent debates based on the issue. They're not these mud-throwing debates you have in the Canadian Parliament, in the American uh, Congress, in the British Parliament, in the Chamber of Deputies of France, and so forth, in the Bundestag in Germany, and on and on. No, they are recent debates because even if there is a little bit of fireworks, there cannot be too many because they know that in the end they have to come up with something that the people will support. The result has been far less polarization in Switzerland, in Switzerland than in any other democracy, than in any, rep in any representative democracy. 
Even Sweden now, which has represented the democracy, even Sweden is polarized. Remember decades ago, Sweden is to be considered a kind of paradise of tranquility? Well, no more. But Switzerland has achieved amazing political stability, is the most stable country in the world, for one obvious reason, because the government basically executes what the people want and follows the opinion of the people. It follows the consensus of the citizens. So there is no reason for a system like that to become discredited, to become polarized, because the politicians do what they're expected to do. They're governed for the people, but they govern for the people because they know they have the people breathing down their necks with the referendums. So as politicians, they are not intrinsically more cooperative than American politicians or Canadian politicians or any other politicians. It is the system that forces them to. It is the system that forces them to. Another amazing consequence is that the politicians in Switzerland at the national level, and Switzerland is eight and a half million people, not a big country, but the parliamentarians at the national level, many of them are part-time. And you will not believe this. The Swiss parliament meets four times per year, every time three weeks. That means the Swiss parliament in 12 weeks, which is three months, manages the affairs of the country. So the Swiss have eliminated this crazy, let's fight like hell to win power because we can do a lot of things. No, it has eliminated that. There is even another amazing effect of Swiss direct democracy. The Swiss decided they don't need a big leader, a big president, a big prime minister, somebody who is kind of sometimes they come across or they like to come across as people with a special leadership qualities, special wisdom. It's all BS. It's all just marketing, political marketing. They're just regular guys. So the Swiss realize they don't need such characters. All they need is people who represent the people. So they have, in the executive in Switzerland, they have seven co-presidents. They are equals. The presidency rotates yearly, but is the honorific part only, the representational part. When they make decisions, when they make decisions, they are all equals. And they represent the four major parties. I think if you're an American and you're watching this, and if you are not an American, it's the same. If you are in Canada, in France, in the UK, in Germany, in Japan, in Australia, in New Zealand, in uh, South Korea, in India too, India, a great democracy, which we have to nurture so that uh, the Chinese uh, giant has in front another giant that can stop it because maybe the US will not be strong enough in time. If you are an American and you are frustrated because American politics is so contaminated by all kinds of extraneous issues, they have nothing to do with the common good of the people, then you have to push for direct democracy. You should take to the streets peacefully, but you should speak loud and clear. You should do what the Swiss did almost two centuries ago. Pressure and pressure and pressure the politicians until they bring Swiss style direct democracy. And I say Swiss style, not California style. California style, I cannot go on about this now, but California style direct democracy is much more limited and is also heavily contaminated by the amazing amounts of money that people put into the referendum campaigns in California as a result of that crazy, I say crazy again, that crazy decision by the U.S. Supreme Court that, of course, nobody can touch except the Supreme Court itself. In Switzerland, the Supreme Court cannot touch anything the people have decided. I know there are many misconceptions about direct democracy and sometimes even about Swiss direct democracy. It's almost like a conspiracy of silence. It is almost as if the political class 
the elite class, the wealthy class, the academic class, the people who somehow seem to think that ordinary people are not really that smart, then those people don't really like direct democracy. They like some kind of an elite system. They can go along with the idea of people electing the politicians, but they don't like the idea of people directly deciding. Somehow they consider the people smart enough, wise enough to elect the politicians. But they don't consider them wise enough to decide political issues. Well, I think it's a lot harder to figure out if this politician, if this, if this candidate is going to be a good leader, it's a lot harder than to understand nuclear energy. Because if you have a debate on nuclear energy among the citizenry, if they listen to experts that can put it in ordinary terms so people can understand, the people, the citizens can understand the issue just as well as the, as the politicians. Because the American politicians and the Canadian politicians, they are no experts in nuclear energy. They are no experts in climate change. They are no experts in healthcare. They are not. The majority is just like the average citizen, a person with some education, better than average education, but just a person with no particular skill on almost anything else beyond their field of expertise. So that means the politicians in the United States and in the other countries, they have to listen to experts. But because the situation is so polarized, the politicians in the representative democracy system, they're always thinking, wait a minute, we want to bring these policies about climate change or about energy or about the border. But more or less because the parties are positioned left wing or right wing and they want to win the election, everything is colored by the election, by the coming election. So what they end up doing is hiring experts that reinforce the point of view of the politicians. It is not like the politicians go and say, we are Democrats, we are Republicans, we don't really know which will be the best decision for the country in terms of the border or in terms of nuclear energy, or environmental policies. We just want to listen to the best experts in the country. Preferably, most of them will be independent, not affiliated with any party, and then we'll make up our minds. No, they don't do that. The Democrats bring, bring experts that lean towards Democrats, and the Republicans do the opposite. So, the debate is not really a rational debate. It's an electoral debate. It's a hot debate because what they want to do, both parties, they want to score points to get elected or re-elected. They are not necessarily interested in what is best for the country because first comes to be elected. Because even an honest politician could say, if I am not elected, I cannot do anything good for the country. How can I allow the country to be run by these other guys? So if a politician wants to be honest, he is forced to manipulate the situation so that himself or the party will look good when the next election comes. In the Swiss system, and I use nuclear energy because it's one of the issues the Swiss decided, when you have an issue like nuclear energy that most people do not understand, you have a long drawn out debate in the open, in the public. People discuss it in the family, at work, in uh, TV shows, uh, radio, uh, they go to meetings. There is a lot of debate, but the people, the ordinary people, because they are not fighting to get re-elected, because they are not candidates to anything, the people are interested in listening to all the experts because the people do not want to look good like the politicians want to. The people want to make what they consider the best decision for the country. Of course, there is disagreement because what is best for the country is not an absolute truth. It's a matter of opinion. But they listen to experts for nuclear energy, against nuclear energy, for solar, against solar, coal, etc. They, they listen, and the debate is so wide and so open, and is done with plenty of time, 
by the time the Swiss people go to the po to the polls to decide on a referendum, if they should if they should start to phase out the nuclear plants or not, or if they should in institute stricter border controls or not, or if they should approve homosexual marriage or not, or many other things, they make a better decision than the politicians because their thinking is not contaminated by electoral considerations. And this is why Switzerland is now the most stable country in the world, by far, I would say the most stable, and is also one of the most prosperous. That decision that the people of Zurich made, saying, you screwed up the, manage the management of the pandemic, you screwed it up, and from now on, not just on pandemics, but on anything, we want to have a say, and we want to be the last decision makers if we so decide on laws, policies, and the constitution. So that decision that spread to all of Switzerland has been a wonderful decision for Switzerland because it has turned Swiss citizens into the most responsible citizens in the world for one reason and an obvious reason, because they are responsible for the future of the country and the governance of the country. The Swiss people cannot say, oh, the politicians blew it again. The politicians don't care about us. The Swiss people cannot do that because they have the power and they use it to make sure the politicians do what the people consider should be done and that they don't do what the people consider should not be done. This is what I wanted to bring to you, that Swiss democracy is a better system. In my opinion, Swiss democracy is to representative democracy, American, Canadian, and all of the rest, what an electric car is to a steam engine. I don't even say to an internal combustion engine, to a steam engine. Representative democracy was a great advance over totalitarians, absolute kings, aristocracy, rule, and so forth. But now we have direct democracy as the next natural step because representative democracy gave us freedom to speak, gave us freedom, and also gave us the freedom to choose the rulers. But it has not given us the freedom to make decisions. Direct democracy gives us freedom, gives us the power to choose the rulers, the politicians, also in a direct democracy, the rulers are not so, and also gives us the power to decide. It really, direct democracy turns people into adults. I'm not saying people in representative democracies, they are not adults, but they do not have to behave as responsible as people in a direct democracy. Because in a representative democracy, in the US, in Canada, in all the other countries, you can be very responsible about choosing the candidate for whom you will vote. But once you're voted, there's nothing you can do because you don't have the power. You don't have the power to control the politician until the next election. But you know, the politicians have lots of opportunity to do many things between elections. And even if sometimes they are forced to take a decision that is against the will of the people, they figure, well, maybe by the time the next election comes, the people who have forgotten or what we're doing will, sh will show that it's good or some other issue will come up or the political party, the rivals will screw up big and therefore will get elected again. I just think that we really have to think hard about this. We have to think hard and we have to figure out that we have to understand that direct democracy is a better system. In the 1700s or the 1800s, the Swiss used the American Constitution for inspiration. As I said, they improved on it by including in it elements of direct democracy, substantial elements. 
They didn't do away with the representative politicians. They still have the politicians in Switzerland, but they have clipped their wings. And you may be surprised, but the Swiss politicians are the politicians who are held in the highest regard by their own people. The Swiss people have Swiss politicians in high regard. You can guess why. Because the Swiss politicians do what the people want. The Swiss politicians, they never stray too far. Of course, in a direct democracy, it is impossible. It will be impossible for the politicians to involve the peoples, their peoples, into wars without the consent of the people, except in case of sudden attack that you have to react immediately. But the Americans wouldn't have gone to the war in Vietnam, or if, it, if they would have gone, it would have been because the people approved in a referendum. The same for the war in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in many others. And the same for the Allies who collaborated with the Americans in those wars, you know, the Australians and many others, for example, in Vietnam. When the people have to decide about war, they think about it a lot harder than the politicians because they know they are sending themselves or their children to possible death. When the politicians decide because of their age and because they are of, in a privileged cocoon, they're not really concerned about dying themselves or their children dying. Sometimes it may have happened. No, so the politicians they make decisions about war much more lightly. Right now we sit in the Ukraine. And let me make it clear. I support supporting the Ukraine. But they think there has to be a limit. And the limit should be set not by Mr. Biden, not by Mr. Trudeau, not by many of the other NATO leaders. It should be set by the people. There should be discussion, public discussion, and there should be a referendum with several questions to decide the extent to which we authorize our governments to get involved in the Ukraine war. I have another video about this to go into more detail. But you see, direct democracy brings more calm, more rational uh, debate to the public issues. It is a better system. And also, it's not polarized right and left. You can find solutions which are much more pragmatic. For example, you know the Americans, they have this thing, oh, universal health care, no, it cannot be, that's socialist, that's too expensive. And the other side says, we must have universal health care. How can we have people without health care? And I think, I think the Americans should have universal health care. But the Swiss have found a different way to most countries. They have fully universal health care, better universal health care than the Canadians, than the French, than the Germans, than the British, than anybody else. They have the best universal health care in the world. But they have done it using a kind of capitalist formula to achieve a social goal. It's a private system, financed by the premiums, just like people in the States and in the other countries now finance the insurance companies, right? Because the insurance companies are financed, financed by the people who pay the premiums. That's how it works. So the Swiss government and the Swiss people decided, let's have a private-based system, but supervised by the government. So in Switzerland, they have a universal health care, the best in the world, with shorter waiting lists, with everybody having a family doc doctor. They have more doctors per capita than almost anybody else, and well-paid doctors. They decided it will be held, it will be supported by the premiums. Everybody has to pay the premium, but the people who cannot afford the premium, because they are expensive, the premiums, but the people who cannot afford the premium, the government subsidizes them. Result, great social service with capitalist principles overseen, supervised by the government. 
There are many other things about the Swiss system, about the territorial organization. Like, for example, in Switzerland, they apply direct democracy at all levels. The philosophy in the Swiss system is the lowest level of government should handle as many issues, as many policies as possible. Therefore, it should also have the power to tax. And the Swiss municipalities, they collect about 30% of the taxes people pay. Then they have the state or canton government. Anything that the municipality cannot handle or decides that it cannot handle, it delegates upwards to the canton, to the canton government. The canton government does the same thing. It handles, tackles all issues that it considers it can afford to do and also collects approximately 30% of the taxes. Whatever it cannot handle or considers it should not handle, like, for example, defense or the supervision of the national health care system or foreign policy, then the cantons delegate that to the federal government. And at the federal level, the people pay also about 30% of the taxes. I bet you, in your country, you pay most taxes to the national government. In the U.S., for sure. In Canada, for sure. In France, for sure. In the UK, for sure. That means that the lower governments don't have much power. The power is given to the national government. And if you combine that with the fact that you have representative democracy at the national level, and in representative democracies, the politicians have all the power, and they fight like hell for that power, you have the situation that you have in these other countries and now in the states where they cannot bring about universal health care. They fight and fight and fight and fight and they cannot bring about universal health care. However, we do have universal car care in the United States. So what are more important, cars or people? You decide. Please inform yourselves about Swiss direct democracy is not what some people will tell you about. By the way, Switzerland is a multicultural country. It has four founding nationalities. You will never hear about it. The German speakers, the French speakers, the Italian speakers, and the Roman speakers of Switzerland get along much better than the unilingual speakers of many other countries because of direct democracy. Each group, no matter how small, has a lot of autonomy. This is something the Americans should copy to, and the Canadians and many others, for example, to deal with their minorities, including the native minorities. Instead of being part of some ministerial department or some secretary, they should have their own small territory with as much autonomy as possible. This is another area which is very interesting. Switzerland is divided in many small territories, none of them powerful enough to challenge the national sovereignty, but independent enough to, for people to feel satisfied, to feel in control. And remember, they collect a lot of the taxes so they can do their own things. Some people will tell you, oh, but direct democracy can turn into the dictatorship of the majority. Not so. In Switzerland, 63% of the people are German speakers, and the French speakers, who are, who are 20%, the Italian speakers, which are about 10%, and the Romanche speakers, which are very, I mean, they're 65,000. That's even less than 1%, I think. They don't have the problems the people have, the minorities have in Canada, in the States, in France, in Spain, in the United Kingdom, etc., they don't, because it's also a better system of government. So it's not just that it's direct democracy. It is that it's direct democracy at all levels, and also this wise of the idea of dividing the country in small territories. So the majority does not become the, the, the dictatorship of the minority. It's not so. Also, the people can decide complex issues. Switzerland is the best governed country in the world, and the people make the key decisions. It's not too slow. They go slow in some decisions because they want to make sure there is consensus, there is agreement. But when they have to move, they move fast. The Swiss put in place 
COVID policies, more or less like everybody else. By the way, the COVID policies in Switzerland also went to a referendum because many people felt that the policies were not adequate, they were excessive, they were not justified. You know, the debate that we have in all the other countries. But instead of engaging into this crazy debate of saying, oh, the people who don't believe in vaccines, they are nuts, the Swiss didn't do that. The Swiss, the people who didn't agree that vaccines were uh, adequate or whatever, they collected the signatures. The issue went to a referendum because obviously the government couldn't wait for a referendum to put in place the policies since people were dying. But the issue went to a referendum. The people were able to collect the signatures. It went to a referendum and the people sided with the government. End of the issue. End of the issue. You know, in the States and in Canada, this on and the trackers in Canada and in the States, the, the discussions are still going on about Fauci doing this and that. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely crazy. In Switzerland, they don't have that because they say, let's decide it democratically after rational, thorough discussion. discussion. Let's decide it democratically. And the people who lose a referendum because it's a democratic decision, because a decision made by the people, the only option they have is to accept it if they are Democrats. They have to accept it. They obviously have the opportunity of mobilizing the people again later on if they feel the mood of the country has changed or the previous referendum is causing damage to the country and they could reverse the decision. But you see, it is a truly democratic decision. In the American system, the Canadian system, the French system, all other representatives, the, the politicians do not make democratic decisions. A decision made by a democratically elected politician, because he was elected, he was or she was elected by the majority, is not a democratic decision because the politicians are a very small minority and therefore we have a minority deciding and prevailing over the will of the majority because the majority cannot intervene into their decisions. So the decisions of the leaders in these other countries are not democratic decisions, are decisions made by democratically elected leaders, but that does not mean the decision is democratic. The decision is democratic only if the people vote and the citizens decide. It is a better system. I think it is time for the Americans, for the sake of the Americans and the whole world, to take a page out of the Swiss experience and study what the Swiss do, just like the Swiss did when they adopted many of the provisions of the American Constitution. Maybe by luck, maybe because they were more astute, I have no idea. I, th I think a lot of it has to do with luck and common sense. But the Swiss really have developed a clearly superior system to representative democracy. So I hope that you study, you become familiar with Swiss-style direct democracy. I have no doubt that you will conclude that is the system the United States and all other representative democracies need. And we need it now and we need it urgently because I even hear some people now admiring the Chinese system because of the way they make decisions. For God's sake, it's a totalitarian dictatorship. It's almost a crypto-Nazi regime based on a supposed cultural or ethnic Chinese superiority. I mean, when some people are starting to see that system as an alternative to democracy, something is very wrong with democracy. And if you don't want the United States to fall into the hands of populists of the right or the left, or even worse, to fall into the hands of a totalitarian if the democracy goes to pot, Remember, Germany had a representative democracy in the 30s. They have many smart people in Germany at the time. Many, many, many. Many Nobel Prizes. It was a highly educated country. 
but they fell into the hands of Hitler because the politicians in the German representative democracy discredited the system so much that many Germans, in desperation, they say, well, maybe this guy, Adolf, maybe he can fix things. Well, you know what happened next, right? The remedy was worse than the disease, but, but that's what happens when democracy shakes. And there are precedents, like the one I just mentioned. Representative democracy can collapse. Direct democracy cannot collapse because the politicians do not have enough power to separate themselves from the people. They have to stay close to the people. So if they stay close to the people and the people have the last say, why would they want the pe why will the people want to wreck the country? Why will they want to destroy that system? They don't want to. And this is where the amazing stability of Switzerland comes from. Remember, the history of Switzerland is far more stable than any of its neighbors. It's not like Switzerland is an island, you know, in Antarctica, uh, away from everybody else. No, Switzerland has the four ethnic groups I mentioned, and around Switzerland we have the Germans, the Austrians, the Italians, the French, and you know the history of those countries, all of them are far less stable even now. They are less stable than Switzerland. So the Swiss system has something that somehow goes beyond ethnicity and culture. It's a better system. My mission in life now is to promote this system. And I hope that others help help me and help others who are also interested in promoting the system because they realize it's a better system. Spread it in your country, in the United States, mostly now and urgently, because if the United States fixes itself, then we don't have a problem in the other democracies. But if American democracy continues, it's continued discred discrediting, because you only have to watch the debates any time, I mean, the speeches of the politicians, of most politicians, to tell you the truth, to me, they speak like demagogues. They don't speak, they speak only to the emotions of the people. And you can see they're only interested in discrediting the other party and gaining power. The people are just an instrument. The stability of the Swiss system is good for everybody, for the poor, for the middle class, and for the rich. The rich are very interested in the stability for obvious reasons. So this is why in the United States, all people should support the transition to direct democracy. The poor and the middle class, because it will bring more prosperity to them. Yes, Switzerland is more prosperous than the United States. And of course, much better universal social systems, and also much better for capitalists. Everybody knows Switzerland is a good country for capitalists. So there you have it. There's no reason not to support the transition to direct democracy because it's better over the long haul for everybody. Thank you very much. I hope you like this video and you follow other videos I will be publishing. And please, please, please help me spread the idea of direct democracy. Thank you very much.